With today's lecture, we turn from the Nicomachean ethics to the politics. And this order isn't at all arbitrary or, or whimsical on my part. As I noted very briefly last time, at the end of Book 10 of the Ethics, Aristotle himself makes the case for turning from ethics, or the study of the, the habituation we need in order to, to shape good character, to political life. Now, I propose today to do three things. First, I'd like to examine the, the case for this turn to the examination of political life. Why is it important, according to Aristotle? Second, I'd like to sketch Aristotle's very famous argument in the first book of the Politics that human beings are, by nature, political animals. And then third, we're going to take a look at his critique of various regimes, both actual ones and ones that have only been imagined, regimes that have claimed to be good or, or even the best sort of governments. This critique is, is found in Book 2 of The Politics. To the case, then, for the turn from ethics to politics. Already in, in Book 2 of the Ethics, Aristotle had said that we're inquiring into virtue above all so that we may become good. In other words, for a practical purpose. And now, at the end of Book 10 of the Ethics, he picks up again on this same idea. He says that arguments or, or speeches have only a very limited power to persuade most people, namely those who have a good nature and who've already been raised in such a way as to cherish what is noble and to despise what is base, to, to use Aristotle's language. In this context, he makes an interesting criticism of the sophists, men like Thrasymachus, Protagoras, and, and Gorgias, whom we've met. Maybe because their own affairs are, are so bound up entirely, really, with speech, with, with making speeches and teaching others to do so, they exaggerate the power of speech over most human beings, according to Aristotle. It would be difficult to, to acquire, and maybe impossible to maintain, real political power in the absence of force, given the, the resistance of, of many people to the dictates of, of reason or speech alone. It's not enough for most people, in other words, simply for a, a, a teacher or a parent to, to praise justice in the absence of things like courts and, and jails. In this crucial respect, then, Aristotle accuses the apparently very sophisticated sophists of being unsophisticated or naive even about the nature of human beings. We become open to the, the call of speech or reason only once we've acquired certain moral habits. And those habits arise not through reasoning, but through the use of rewards and punishments, of pleasures and pains, habituation in short. And though the family is the, the first and in some ways the most important locus of such habituation or training, Aristotle makes clear that the character of the family is itself in turn affected by the kind of broader political community in which our, our families are found. In short, for those serious about virtue, be it intellectual or moral or both, it's necessary to turn to an analysis of political life so that we can see how best to instill the habits of virtue in a community. Now, the end of the ethics prepares us in this way for the beginning of the politics. And so we turn to the politics with the expectation that we'll see in it prescriptions for laws and lawmaking that will be congenial to the, to the two kinds of virtue Aristotle has sketched for us. We'll have to see whether or not this expectation is met. But without further ado, let's turn then to Book 1 of Aristotle's Politics. Well, the beginning of the politics is concerned to establish a single and very famous proposition, that a human being is, by nature, a political animal. Now, I should say that by political here, Aristotle doesn't mean democratic or republican, small d, small r, or any other specific kind of polity. In the course of the book, he'll discuss everything from the most absolute rule of one human being to the most egalitarian democracy. And all of these properly fall under the heading political. 
Still, though, this rather amazing variety in the, in the way that we can organize ourselves into, into communities, that shouldn't hide the more fundamental fact that, according to Aristotle, by nature, we are compelled to organize ourselves into one form of community or another beyond or above the family. And the goal of this broader community is not only mere life, but living well. This is his preliminary description of the political community, whose goal is to see to it that we all live well. Now this proposition, that again, that human beings are by nature political, might not, at first blush at least, seem so controversial. But in fact, it was on just this point that the great uh, political philosopher of the early modern period, Thomas Hobbes, attacked Aristotle by name. Well, what did Hobbes say? According to Hobbes, ants and bees are much more political by nature than we are. Ants, after all, don't need laws or customs or conventions. We do. Ants don't engage in civil wars. We do. The facts, I think, that Hobbes cites are, of course, undeniable. But the difference between Aristotle and Hobbes proves, I think, to concern their respective and different understandings of what is nature or the natural. Let me try to sketch this for you. Roughly speaking, nature for Thomas Hobbes is the lowest common denominator, what is necessarily present in all human beings, no matter what. Hobbes pointed in particular to our equal capacity to kill one another, and very closely associated with this, the natural fear of death, especially violent death. And this, he said, is present in all of us uh, and is really our most important experience, the fear of violent death. That's what's natural. For Aristotle, nature means that which is the the full completion of a thing. It's, It's completed or perfected character. It's the target at which we all aim, but which many, maybe even most of us, never quite fulfill. It's not that Aristotle was unaware of the natural things that Hobbes focused on. We remember that that Aristotle in his psychology uh, speaks of the vegetative part of the soul and of the passions, including, of course, fear. But dogs and sea lions, they know fear too. And so what marks us as human beings has to be something other, something more than the capacity to feel such fear or other passions. Now, in the last part of the ethics, we saw Aristotle's quite powerful and, and I think, beautiful answer to the question of what the peculiarly human aspect of our nature is. To repeat, the capacity to reason, and even, in the highest case, to philosophize. Well, here in the politics, such such lofty heights seem to be forgotten, at least for the time being. Here, as I've said in the politics, Aristotle insists that it's our ability to form political communities that sets us off from the other animals. And so this raises a question. How can we put together what Aristotle had said about our nature in Book 10 of the Ethics with what he says here? Well, I think we can do it in this way. We are by nature political animals, according to Aristotle, because we are the animals possessed of reason or speech. Human speech indicates not only things that are pleasant or painful, the voices of animals can can do that too when they cry out and so on, but human speech also indicates what is good and bad and just and unjust. It's our perception of things just and unjust above all else that marks us as political animals. Why, according to Aristotle? Because it's our shared partnership in opinions about what's just and unjust moral and immoral, if you like, that constitutes a city, a polis. Aristotle here explicitly denies, by the way, that bees are political. The unities that they form, the hives, are really sub-political. Why? Because politics is bound up not just with with living together or even with performing a common function, as, as bees certainly do. It's bound up with living in accord with perceptions of justice and arguments about justice. Only human beings can do this. Human beings are by nature political animals, therefore. Human beings are political animals 
because they alone are equipped with the, the speech or the reason necessary to form opinions about justice and injustice. And so only they can form communities that aim at living well and not just at securing mere life. Well, the comparison with with Hobbes, I think, is helpful because Hobbes drew the necessary consequence of his premise that we are not by nature political, or if you like, that all politics is artificial, man-made. That conclusion was this. In the state of nature, originally, there is nothing just or unjust, according to Hobbes. All justice comes into being only with the the artificial community. But Aristotle, for his part, insisted not only that we are naturally political animals, but also that there is something just by nature. We saw this, after all, in the fifth book of the Ethics, in his famous discussion of what is just by nature. To put it simply, Hobbes denied and Aristotle asserted that justice, the concern for right and wrong, has a kind of natural hold on our hearts. Now what I propose to do is to sketch some of the highlights of the rest of Book One of the Politics. There, as I'll argue, Aristotle in fact significantly qualifies, he makes, if you like, more subtle, his famous assertion that we are naturally political and that the political community is natural. Now to be clear, before I go into any of the details, I think Aristotle never retracts his fundamental point in Book One of the naturally political character of human beings. I think that stands. But I think we've read enough Aristotle by now to expect him to to anticipate objections to his own argument, including even those made by Hobbes centuries later. Well, I've stressed Hobbes' quarrel here with Aristotle because I think it's clear and, and relevant to us. But there is another possible challenge to Aristotle's philosophic or scientific stress on the the natural character of political life and of the political community. And that challenge or criticism doesn't come from his fellow philosophers, but from those who killed Socrates, to be as blunt as possible. To argue, as Aristotle will, that the city is something that grows naturally and is for that reason subject to a human science, political science, To do that is to deny what many people held to be true then, that the cities were founded by gods, that they were watched over by gods. Think of Athena's special role in Athens, or or Zeus, the the greatest of the Greek gods, who is said to have founded Crete, um, or at least uh, in the case of Crete, that his son Minos uh, had, had taken laws from Zeus and given it to the people of Crete, so a kind of divine legislation. There's something implicitly anti-theological, if I could put it that way, about Aristotle's political science. And this is a fact that he will allude to from time to time and that we'll watch for. Well, the outline of the rest of Book One is is fairly easy to state. After the the preliminary argument that the city is by nature, we, it's political animals, that's in chapters one and two, Aristotle devotes the next ten chapters to investigating the main building block, if you like, of the political community, which he says here is the household. So he gives an extended analysis of the household. Why? Because if the things out of which the city grows are themselves natural, then the city too will be natural. So in book one, in a way, you could say that we witness the growth of the city. And the verb to grow in Greek has as its root the word nature. Now, under the general heading of the management of the household, Aristotle is going to take up three subsidiary arts, you could call them. First, the art of ruling slaves. Second, the art of acquisition or money-making. And then, in a single chapter, what he calls spousal rule and parental rule, the rule of husbands and wives, the rule of parents over children. Now, for our purpose, the first two of these, that is, the, the discussion of the slaves, and the discussion of money-making are by far the most important, so we'll look at those. Let's begin by by taking a glance uh, more closely at Aristotle's famous inquiry into the practice of slave mastery, the rule of slaves. First, he gives a definition of a slave. A slave, Aristotle says, is an animate tool 
used for production. He then turns, as he does so often, not to announce his own view, but to listen to the, list, to listen to the opinions of others on this question of slavery. And those opinions differ over the justice of slavery. Some, he tells us, assert that the rule over slaves is just another kind of rule or expertise, as legitimate as any other. Other people, he says, assert that all slavery, without exception, is unjust and violent. So there were abolitionists then in Aristotle's time. Now Aristotle, for his part, having sketched these two extreme positions, he makes the, the, the argument that there is such a thing as a slave by nature. There are then slaves, and it would not be unjust to rule them as such. But whom does he have in mind here? How does he define such a slave? The slave by nature is one who can perceive reason, but lacks it himself. Here Aristotle seems to have in mind the mentally defective. Now I, I add, of course, that, that this argument here is quite jarring to us, and even, even shocking, I suspect. But the core of his argument is simply this. There are a few human beings who naturally lack the capacity to govern themselves, and in those cases it would be better for someone else to take over their guidance. So put in those terms, maybe Aristotle's argument is a little less harsh. But in any case, we can't lose sight of the forest here. How does this argument square with the two competing positions about slavery? There, those who condemn all slavery as unjust are incorrect, that's clear. But what about those who praise the practice of slavery in the Greek cities, which, as, as Aristotle notes here, was to enslave those who were defeated in war? Everybody, men, women, children, would be taken over as slaves. Here, I think, is the important, even the daring or radical implication of Aristotle's argument. Judged from Aristotle's own natural standard, the current practice of slavery throughout the world is unjust. Defeat on the battlefield is not, according to Aristotle, just title to enslave anybody. The current and therefore, so to speak, universal practice of slavery is unnatural, according to Aristotle, because it enslaves those who don't deserve to be and for whom it isn't a good thing. So we can't be distracted here by Aristotle's admittedly jarring argument that there is a slave by nature. We've got to see that he condemns the actual practice of slavery as unnatural. And I might note here, by the way, that Aristotle anticipates the, the complete abolition of sl slavery through what we would call technology. How so? He says that if statues could move on their own, or looms could move on their own, there would be no need of slaves at all. I suggest that this first inquiry into the parts of the city, the household, shows that in almost every case, the city is dependent on something that, according to Aristotle, is unnatural, namely unjust slavery. But doesn't that fact cast a shadow on the naturalness of the city, in turn? I think we reach much the same conclusion with, with Aristotle's quite lengthy inquiry into the art of, of acquisition or money-making. He begins from a clear distinction between natural and unnatural acquisition. The basis of the distinction is this. Natural acquisition will satisfy our genuine needs and only the genuine needs. Genuine needs can be met, according to Aristotle, in one of two ways. Through the use of something we acquire, let's say shoes, or through exchange. We can either wear shoes or we can exchange them for something else we need. Now, needless to say, this, this account of the strictly natural kind of acquisition is extremely limited. And what Aristotle has in mind is, compared with the, the sort of staggeringly complex economy of the modern world, of our world, its simplicity itself. But, it's important to note, Aristotle knew firsthand in Athens an economy that was far more complex than what he here describes and praises as natural. In fact, I think every city, not lost in some backwater place, had a much more developed economy than one of, say, simple barter or exchange, one that had, among other things, monetary currency. And currency is, for Aristotle, the thing that drives us away 
from a simply natural acquisition. Why? Because there is, in principle, no limit to the amount of money we can acquire. Nobody, I suppose, in his right mind would want a million pairs of shoes, but I venture to say many of us wouldn't mind a million dollars. What Locke, John Locke was to praise, namely the invention of money, Aristotle here condemns, and he condemns it in the name of nature. Now, here we might accuse Aristotle of being a kind of impractical, pie-in-the-sky dreamer. There's just one problem with this view. Aristotle himself here goes out of his way to describe, with the kind of precision that only he's capable of, the kinds of actual business practices in the world. He knew perfectly well, in other words, that the world does not operate as he indicates, in some sense, it should, the natural way. Well, here's my suggestion. While the natural standard of acquisition is the correct one, it's impossible in political life as political life is and will be lived. And so we're faced with a, a conclusion comparable to the one, actually, that we saw in the case of slavery. As a matter of fact or practice, political communities are all but compelled to make use of unnatural slavery and unnatural acquisition. But if this is so, how or in what sense are these fully uh, natural communities, these political communities? I contend that Aristotle's main argument for the naturalness of the city and of us as, as political beings still stands. I don't think that needs to be retracted. But we see that the community is shot through with merely conventional, in fact, even unnatural practices. The community may well be necessary for us to, to fulfill our specifically human natures. Aristotle says here, in passing, that only a beast or a god doesn't need to live in a political community. We human beings do. But it may also be, in important respects, unnatural, the political community. And this suggestion, I think, is important for the conclusion of the politics, as we'll see. It may well be true that our natures can begin to bloom, if you will, only by living in a community with others, with shared opinions about justice. But is it true as well that the political life is as such the, the peak life, the, the fully human, natural life? Here already, of course, we have reason to doubt. Why? Because the ethics culminates in the explicit answer, no. The philosophic life is superior to the political life, even at, at its peak. We read sections of this last time. And here Aristotle, of course, is perfectly blunt. Or I could give a vivid example here. Socrates, the philosopher, was executed by his community. So great was the, the tension between the life of theoretical virtue and the political life. And as we'll see, Aristotle, too, in his own way, will take up both the greatness of the political life, to be sure, and its necessary limitations. For now, let's turn to look fairly briefly at Book 2 of the Politics. To this point in Book 1, Aristotle has spoken of the city, the polis in Greek. But as he makes clear at the end of Book 1, that is, in a very important respect, too general or, or too abstract, too, too far removed from political life. Why? Because every political grouping is informed by a specific ordering principle, if you like, one that determines its character. And the word for that fundamental ordering principle is politeia, what I'll translate simply as the regime. It can also be translated as, say, constitution, although I think that term tends to import notions of republicanism that could well be absent. After all, a brutal tyranny certainly is a kind of regime. But does it have a constitution? Probably not. The introduction of the idea of the regime is crucial to the rest of the politics. Every other one of its books will be devoted to exploring some aspect of the regime, or of the kinds of regime. After all, to argue that the polis is by nature puts in a way the blessing of the natural on all of them, but are there no important differences between, say, an extreme democracy and a very limited oligarchy? Aristotle will now take as his theme the variety of the regimes that are found in political life. And this, I think, will constitute a further qualification 
of his blanket assertion at the beginning of the naturalness of political life. There's better and worse in politics, and the better will surely fulfill the, the natural standard better than, than do the worse regimes. Now, since I'm a political scientist by training, I might just note here some important differences between Aristotle's political science and at least much of contemporary political science. First, Aristotle's political science is thoroughly evaluative or normative. That is, it's concerned with good, bad, better, and worse. This is why, once he introduces the idea of the regime, he turns immediately to discuss the best regime. What's the peak, the best case? I think it's no exaggeration to say that Aristotle's political science is guided throughout by the desire to discover the best regime, as we'll see. Well, much of contemporary political science, by contrast, seeks to be value neutral, as the phrase is, or, or to eschew all evaluation. From its point of view, the only, difference, the only differences of interest to it between a democratic republic and a totalitarian dictatorship are the measurable or quantifiable differences. And moral judgments typically aren't measurable. So the contemporary political scientist is properly concerned only with quantifiable differences and not moral or normative ones. The scientist as scientist won't pass judgment, as we say, on the existence or non-existence of a free press, say. He could note it, but not pass judgment on it. Aristotle, of course, is not limited in this way. Now, it is a long question as to whose approach is superior. But for now, I just raise a question whether any political science that refuses to say whether this or that regime is morally inferior to another, whether it blinds itself to the most important consideration according to political life itself. In short, can a political science that refuses to evaluate or judge, can it capture the essence of political life, which is, according to Aristotle, the shared opinions about just and unjust? The other thing I think to note about Aristotle's turn to the regime here is that he begins in a Socratic way. That is, he begins by asking the question, what is the best regime? And by looking around for the most impressive answers. He examines here first three actual regimes that were widely admired, Sparta, Crete, and Carthage. And then he looks at three theoretical or imagined regimes that were also held to be best. Uh, the regimes of Plato's Republic, his laws, and then the plans drawn up by someone named Phaleas and those by someone named Hippodamus. Aristotle doesn't begin then by creating out of whole cloth a series of models or ideal types like modern social science. He begins from authoritative opinion, much as Socrates had done. And so he looks at the world from a more, if you like, commonsensical point of view than contemporary political science tends to do. Now, I won't say too much here about the specifics of Aristotle's analysis of these regimes, but it does make for, for fascinating reading. Of the three actual regimes that he treats, the one that comes off best is probably Carthage, a non-Greek city in North Africa. So we should never let it be said that Aristotle was culturally biased, as we say today. The Greek regimes come off least good. As for Sparta and Crete, both of these regimes were well known for the apparent excellence of their laws laws that were regarded as having come directly or indirectly from a god. And so Aristotle's meticulous critique of them is at the same time a critique of, of divine law or what purports to be divine law. He therefore shows how a human science might grapple with what claims to be a, a divinely organized community, a task, I might say, that's not irrelevant in our own time. Part of Aristotle's critique is imminent or from within. That is, he takes the stated purpose of the legislation and shows that it fails to accomplish what it itself says is best or most important, a powerful critique. As for his critique of the regimes of, that are sketched in the Republic and the Laws, it is a sort of model of sober common sense. If there were any doubts as to whether those regimes could ever really come into being, well, I think Aristotle puts them to rest. What's striking here is the rather low ceiling of the discussion, if I could put it that way. Aristotle proceeds here in the manner of a sort of no-nonsense political, rather than a, a student who, who studied with Plato for decades. 
For example, as I already had occasion to note, Aristotle is perfectly silent about philosophy and the philosopher kings even in his discussion of the Republic. He speaks as if he knew nothing of, of philosophy at all, and this is very striking, to be sure. Thus far, we have tracked Aristotle's turn from the study of character or ethics to that of politics. We've considered his, his rightly famous claim that human beings are by nature political animals and his subtle qualification of, of that same claim. We've seen, too, the, the narrowing of his focus from the polis or city to the regime, that is, to the differing ways that the, the various political communities can be organized. And we've seen that he begins with those regimes, regimes in deed or in speech, that were widely held to be best. Each of these he finds wanting, and so Aristotle will eventually have to state what he thinks to be the best regime. But before he can do that, he has to investigate the problem of politics, which is justice or the common good, and it's to that question that we turn next time.